Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So um, thank you everyone uh, for, for uh, joining us today for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, and this is obviously, as you can see here on the title slide, Scythe and PlexTrack Presents, Dealing with the Data. And so uh, hopefully today we'll have a really, uh, probably, uh, well, hopefully not overly casual, but a, a, a pretty a good conversation about topics that are relevant to red teamers or folks who want to become red teamers or even purple team engagements and thinking about adversarial data, data gathering, collection, creation, curation, all of these things that we'll go over here today. Um, really quick by way of introductions. Um, so uh, my name's uh, Adam Mashinchi. I'm the VP of product at Scythe. Um, and I will be acting, I'll do some demonstrations later on, but I'll be uh, acting as MC and I'll keep an eye on the questions for the sake of this. Um, and really quick, I will also introduce the, the other two folks here are kind of on this panel of sorts. And, and first I'll, I'll introduce Tyler Robinson. So Tyler, could you give us just a little bit about who you are and uh, what Mises does? And also something that in your opinion, like why you might be uniquely qualified to talk to us here today about what we're I mean, hopefully that's not too much of a stretch. Uniquely qualified is interesting. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or close. <laughs> no, uh, my name is Tyler Robinson. I'm the managing director of network operations at Nisos. Uh, Nisos is a, a boutique uh, offensive penetration testing uh, consultancy that really deals with uh, solving very large problems for you know Fortune 1 to 100 um, companies. Uh, they have some some very unique problem sets and some some very difficult things to solve, and so we uh, spend a lot of time doing uh, managed intelligence to kind of help solve those. So a lot of ex three letter agency guys and uh, coming to the commercial side to do some some big things. Uh, I myself am uh, a long standing red teamer and offensive security practitioner, uh, working uh, running red team at in Guardians. Uh, Prior to that, Silent Break Security, and really just been hacking since the uh, the early '90s, back when uh, phone pay phones were actually a thing. I know that's pretty hard to imagine. That's the thing you put coins in for those that are you know pre-2000 millennials. Um, but yeah, been been at this a little while, and so bringing some of the offensive and and red team perspective to some of the problems that we've ran into for the last decade that are still barely getting solved. So great. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, and then also, uh, Dan, can you go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, who you are, what you do, what PlexTrack is, and again, to whatever degree you feel comfortable, what make, make you uniquely qualified to discuss whatever we're going to be talking about here today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Adam. And yeah, thanks, Tyler, for joining us as well. Um, Dan DeClaus, CEO and founder of PlexTrack. Uh, PlexTrack, we specialize, uh, we are a platform for reporting and tracking of security findings and vulnerabilities so that uh, you can have a good pulse on your you know, progress over time from a security perspective. Uh, and so we've uh, been uh, you know, excited to, to partner with, uh, with Scythe and, and do this demo and, and uh, highlight all the, all the capabilities that we both have and, and stuff like that. But what makes me uniquely qualified? Yeah, again, um, I, beyond, you know, uh, you know, I've been in the security field for 15 plus years, I've worn a lot of hats, both on red teams and blue teams, both internal teams and external teams. And, uh, you know, through that all have had, um, you know, pain points along the way of, of uh, you know, wanting to be able to handle data better, right, and be able to present data better and actually get the work done uh, and not get tied up and bogged down with process and, and procedures and, and all the red tape that, that ends up happening where some days you just go home and feel like you didn't get anything accomplished. <laughs> so so that's, that's kind of like why I, uh, you know, why we wanted to get PlexTrack up and running and, and uh, so just excited to excited to uh, to have some fun this afternoon. I think it's going to be a good time. Perfect. No, uh, again, thank you both. And and just uh, by way of agenda, so what we're going to be talking about here over the next chunk of time. Um, obviously, we just did our introductions, opening thoughts, and, and then we're going to move our way through these topics. First, talking about well, really a kind of a Tyler piece to camera about the challenges red teams and red teamers have. 
Um, and that can be open-ended and we'll have you know, a bit of discussion around that. Then we'll talk about gathering data and red team data and actionable and adversary data and being able to utilize that. We'll, uh, we'll do, sh uh, show off some Scythe stuff for that. And then we'll take that data that we'll have generated and par uh, parsed through and we'll uh, integrate it into the site, uh, sorry, into the FlexTrack platform, in which case, you know, Dan will be able to show us the way that these kind of red team pools of data can come together and be analyzed. And then we'll kind of just summarize it up and we'll save Q&A for the end. Don't hesitate to throw a question uh, in the Q&A part of this. We'll all be keeping an eye on it. If it's relevant and pertinent to whatever we're talking about, we might do it then, or we'll save the questions for the end. So um, with that out of the way, uh, Tyler, can you go ahead and paint a picture for us about common headaches and difficulties and just the challenges you've seen as someone who's been in the red teaming industry for as long as you have and the kinds of issues you've run into when it, especially in the context of red team and data gathering specifically? Yeah, a lot of, so this is, I mean, this is a very, very common theme and, and common problems that we run into. Um, you'll, any of the podcasts you listen to, any of the red teamers you talk to, most of the research you see kind of out in the space really kind of correlates into several issues that offensive people have. Uh, as, as much as it seems like offensive people don't really have all that many issues, we just hack all the things all day and it's fun and glamorous. Uh, it does take a substantial amount of, of time and research and, and work to do a lot of the things we do. I mean, the knowledge itself just to get up to speed and to, uh, to do the work that we do, knowing you know, all the systems, all the networks, all the different intricacies of all the technologies that we, that we touch and break and, and help uh, remediate, uh, really, that's that's kind of some of the aftermath uh, of what it takes to get up and going. And some of the, the most common headaches have a theme around them. Um, you'll notice that as security improves, which if we're doing our, our job right as red teamers, uh, security should be improving everywhere, right? Which it has. Um, that time to kind of build and modify and adjust and... Uh, kind of create different payloads that get around certain protections that get around EDR, building infrastructure that uh, evades firewalls, that uh, doesn't allow uh, the blue teams to just easily detect, uh, you know, beaconing. Because um, from a red team standpoint, we really have to step our game up every time we come to the table and emulate the threats that are continually evolving uh, from the adversaries that are facing real blue teams. Otherwise, we're not doing our job properly. And so we really have to bring our A game, which uh, trains the blue team to do a better job. And so that time to build, uh, to do that research, to code up different binaries, to build the infrastructure, to find bypasses and uh, evade AV and firewalls, all of these things um, lead up to us getting caught, usually eventually, um, not always, but eventually. And all those things, they cost time and they cost resources and they cost money. And so the problem you run into as a red team, we're not the adversaries. We don't have unlimited time or unlimited budget. And so we have to be very careful with our client's time and understand that we're uh, in this finite amount of time to test, get good coverage and comprehensive coverage. And to do that, uh, that's, a, that's a real balancing act. And we can only uh, emulate as well as we have resources and budget to do so. And so all these things that take all this time that eventually uh, you know, lead to, to a report um, those things are very difficult to do and cost money. And then you end up with the reporting part. And that's another real big issue that red teamers run into is we're very focused. We're very goal oriented. Uh, we're very head in the weeds, down in the dirt, trying to figure out, you know, the next bypass or how to get something to execute or, you know, where the, the crown jewels are, or how to get to those crown jewels. Uh, and so doing all of that is very, very hard and, and thought intensive and we get very focused and so notes and reporting stuff often get skipped. And so keeping track of infrastructure, keeping track of binaries, keeping track of where you uh, touched in the network, what you left behind on a device or a box. Uh, all of these things are very hard to do uh, continually and do well. And they take time and they take resources and they take cycles away from the actual test itself. And then that leads to the very last part, and that's reporting. Reporting sucks. We all know that we all hate reporting. Uh, most of us would probably do this job for free, uh, but we get paid to do the, do the report. The deliverable the client gets and what they have for an actionable 
uh, and meaningful piece to go off of what they pay the money for is the report. And so that, that leads to the part of keeping track of all those things really has uh, a value add to the client. The better we can do that uh, and the faster we can do that and the more accurate we can do that, uh, then the better the report that the client gets and the more actionable intel they have to act upon it. And so that's where we really start to run into some of these headaches and these balancing acts. And as a red team, you know, working with all of this data and keeping track of it and then generating something of substantial quality and a technical aspect becomes very difficult. Hey, Tyler, I got a quick question for you. Like when you're, when you're in a red team engagement that you've maybe done before on the same client or, um, or even if you're like an internal team, but you have like multiple business units that you're testing on, how often, and is this, is this a problem um, where you, know, you, you, you want to show off, I mean, and you want to be able to emulate the new things that have come out, but then you come back, you know, and basically they haven't fixed anything from the time before. How, is, that, is that a common theme? That's, that's still very prevalent and really depending on the maturity of the organization, their resources and budget, and you know, not always to the fault of them, there are you know, business decisions, risk decisions, and uh, resource limitations that often fall into place. But that is, that's a common thing that happens is uh, as you go back to test, you end up finding the same path or the same vulnerabilities. And that really sucks from a red team standpoint. It does take some of the challenge away. Like you know, you know, you can, you can get to your objective or goal that same way. Uh, but you're really trying to emulate the newest thing. You're trying to provide value. Uh, but that also comes to a, a third problem that then brings up now where does this prioritization of, you know, do you demonstrate the same risk and you put more priority because you just hit it again and got the same results? Do you try and find new, uh, more comprehensive coverage of whatever network you're or segment you're testing? Uh, and then how do you help the, the blue team um, address these things that are obviously a, an issue. Did we not provide enough recommendations or a mitigating control or compensating control that can be put into place effectively? Uh, or did we not provide enough detail around the particularities? Or maybe the report wasn't received well because of the way we articulated that to uh, the business group or the executives. So these are things that have to be addressed and they're problems that we consistently see which is why as an industry, like especially as the offensive team and red team, like we really have to get better at helping our blue team and making sure that we know that we're on the same page, really providing that value add to, uh, to the business entities and being able to articulate and speak very clearly to the executives and the business risk. Because at the end of the day, we've said this many times before, uh, we're all capitalists. We're all here to make money. And if, uh, if what I'm saying causes the business to not make money, then I'm not doing my job right. Because... Uh, that is, uh, there's got to be ways in which we enable the business to make money and do that securely and provide creative recommendations. That's why we're hackers. That's why we're here. That's why we're on the good side and, and trying to help do this is because we have a creative mind that should be lent and very, um, very thoroughly provide that blue team different ways to address these issues that they're running into. And actually, Tyler, that, that leads me to a question of, you know, talking about the end result and the report that you give to a customer um, and making sure that that thing has value. I mean, value seems to be a very subjective term, right? Because if you hand a report with a list of TTPs and example commands of how to execute those things to an executive, they're going to be quite puzzled as to what that report means. Whereas if you give a, you know, a credit score or a grade to a blue teamer, they will also be curious as to what that means. So could you speak a little bit about the challenges or how you might be splitting the difference on those sorts of things to make sure that your results have value. And just a little bit about, um, to whatever degree, how often do you make two reports, one that has a grade and one that has technical, or just uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, that, and that, that is a, a very common problem with inside the industry. Based on the level of skill of your offensive team or the pen test company testing you, um, the level of sophistication that the, the offensive team is bringing based on perhaps a budget or a time frame that was given by a client. And then the report that's delivered is contingent on all of those uh, peculiarities and, and intricacies. So you run into an issue where your grade may be subjective to whoever's doing the test, whoever's writing the test, even from the same company, uh, that could change. And that doesn't even incorporate some of the, the issues you run into when you start talking about different frameworks you're testing against or different compliance metrics, whether it's NIST, whether it's 
you know, uh, for an ISO test, whether you were following the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, uh, and for the love of God, like a lot of the companies now like following some of these like TTPs and, and frameworks, they're really getting stuck in the weeds on, on very, very specific IOCs. Like we've got to get past this kind of IOCs. They've got a great framework that provide a lot of value, but you have to, from a, from an adversary standpoint and from a blue team defensive standpoint, you really have to understand that you're not there and whoever's providing these from a red team standpoint needs to not be giving you IOCs. Uh, you need to be, really addressing the behavior, addressing the fundamentals, getting the core concepts right, and really starting to evaluate the behavior from, from a top level down. Like, how are we addressing lateral movement? We're not just addressing WMIC or we're not uh, addressing the latest uh, cool uh, DLL or COM hijack for lateral movement. Like, those are particular IOCs. You really have to evaluate, okay, maybe we need host-based firewalls uh, and we need some data classification or host classifications to start uh, from a high level behavior analytics side and really address the core problem and core concepts of, hey, hosts can talk to each other, not how they're talking to each other. And so those are the things that uh, from a deliverability standpoint, yeah, those are very, very technical and that should be included in the report, but you also have to tie that back to the business and the business risk that that's associated. And then you have to speak the executive language. What's your return on investment for enabling host-based firewalls through an EDR investment? And why is that EDR investment going to pay dividends uh, from a business standpoint and risk standpoint? So really making sure as an offensive team, we are understanding what the business needs are, how the business operates and makes money, and then correlating those back to and speaking to the executives that have stake. Uh, not even just the executives, but even the info systems people that have stakes with inside of these environments and some of the problems and and issues that they may have with implementing uh, a lot of these controls. And so really addressing all of those pieces makes for a great report. But again, this is a substantial amount of undertaking from writing the report uh, to tracking the data to also having all of these areas get tested during, you know, an engagement or a red team. And so keeping track of all this data, setting all this up and making sure you're doing all of this different testing um, in a way that can be measured time and time again accurately without getting stuck in the weeds on a framework becomes a very, very difficult problem, which is why we run into the issue of red team um, the term red team or pen tests being so convoluted and, and different levels of pen tests or red teams being conductive and people getting very confused on what they're actually buying versus what they're actually getting. Got it. And uh, one, just one more question kind of off of that. Can you give from your perspective, the delta between a red team and a pen test, right? Just again, so we're all level set and it, it, understand that this is a very, hot button issue at times like now, but uh, just from your perspective, kind of the short uh, answer delta between those two things. Very loaded question. Yeah, it is a loaded <laughs> question. So just, uh, it, I mean, you may give, take it as, as, as uh, All right, broad so or specific as you want. We'll, we'll leave this a little bit more broad just, just because of uh, potentially the audience and, and what we're trying to address and cover from a topic standpoint. But I would say, the commercialization of a red team where we are taking and doing a adversarial emulation is different from a pen test in the course that it has very specific goals and objectives and has the potential to emulate uh, a set of adversaries across an extended time frame and so these particular things are, are kind of they can all be kind of digested and, and split apart and um, taken out of context when we're talking about red team versus pen test. But if you correlate and bring all those together where you have uh, an unhindered scope, you've got an extended time frame, and you're really kind of bringing the adversarial uh, simulation to test the response capabilities of the blue team, to test the processes and procedures and people uh, of the defensive teams from an adversarial standpoint and what their capabilities are to remediate uh, or detect and then remediate and their time to detection and time to remediation delta. So that would be kind of where I would put the, the red team. Now a pen test uh, can cover a lot of that area, but a pen test is going to be more specifically focused on getting comprehensive coverage of vulnerabilities, um, 
across an entire organization, maybe a high level view of how we prioritize what security risks are in an organization, what vulnerabilities exist, and how do we prioritize those. And that can be misconfigurations, that can be people, that can be policies and procedures, and these pen tests can be an extended time frame, but it's really doing a much more comprehensive look at the network or maybe even a specific focused area of the network, say a PCI zone, uh, for very specific vulnerabilities that get good coverage. Now that that is very very different from from the red team side of that because it is much less um, much less throw everything at it uh, and kind of be sneaky because you're trying to provide the prioritization and metrics for an organization to start looking and building their security roadmap. So that would be from a very very high level without getting too controversial on it. That would probably be the best I could do. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's perfect. Great. Thank That's you. Great. Well, I think that right there, based on everything you've said about the challenges and gathering of data and the different tools and the different kinds of reports you're generating and all, and all of these problems kind of clicking together, and then given the lens of the red team perspective, um, not, and maybe less so of the, the, the pen testing perspective, because again, we're talking about red teaming here, um, that's a good segue into the kinds of things about data gathering and again, from, from my perspective, from the lens of Scythe, and we can show an example of that. But before we move on, you know, Dan, do you have any more questions for Tyler or Tyler, do you have any kind of last statements or on, no, the, on these problems? Yeah, no, I think, I think you highlighted it well. I think, you know, um, the, the ongoing collaboration between those teams, I think is, you know, between the red team and the, and the, and the blue team is, is, is vital, right? I mean, uh, I don't know, Tyler, how often, uh, you know, you feel like if you come into an engagement uh, that you did find something from last time, you know, if you, if you feel like, man, if we just, if they'd have just reached out to us, you know, two months after the engagement, we'd have been golden there. Yeah. And I think that that is, that is one of the things that I've been really speaking with uh, a lot of our clients working with um, kind of a lot of the, the industry leaders and, and people like yourself, Dan, where you have a, a platform and a tool that allows or facilitates some of this. This is some of the missing piece and the missing link um, and probably why we see a lot of the um, kind of combativeness between uh, red and blue teams and, and that offensive nature where, you know, Pentest comes in, wrecks everything, writes report, gives it to them two weeks later, and they're, they're out. Like, it doesn't provide a whole lot of value for most clients. And, and honestly, most, most companies aren't even ready for that level of, uh, of a test. But when you really take something like a good red team or, or even a purple team, which I, I think have has a tremendous amount of value, and you really start to build that relationship between the clients, and that is the defensive and the offensive team, whether they're internal, uh, where they're different departments, or they're external, where it's an external uh, pen test company, really building that relationship and understanding you're on the same team, the goal is the same, and it, I'm not doing my job, in fact, I should be held responsible for your failures and anything that's happening uh, that you weren't prepared for that I didn't address. And so kind of enabling and facilitating that collaborative nature and that open, uh, open dialogue, uh, as well as facilitating and being able to answer those questions post uh, engagement, uh, not, not with inside the report or even after the report, that's something that very rarely happens and is very hard to do and or facilitate. And I think that's a great place that the Plex track starts to, to fall into how we start to help facilitate and start to change the InfoSec uh, and security of all, of all these corporations. You see all the breaches in the news today. This really has to get addressed much quicker and we have to do a much better job as offense and defensive practitioners. This is, this is a losing battle that we're already facing very difficult times and we've got to find ways to make this better, make this quicker and do this, do this right. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. And so to that, I mean, to that end right there, using that uh, point of expediency and making some of these things easier to do, that's the lens by which I think is a, we can kick off and talk about Scythe a little bit. And the goal from Scythe is not only to provide attack emulation as a framework and all these things, but the underlying the philosophy by which Scythe is built out is that these sorts of things, emulating an adversary or performing adversary behavior, generating meaningful data out of that, repeating those attacks over and over and over again, providing a single pane of glass for the red team and the blue team and purple team engagement, these things should be trivial. And that's really one of the things that we want to hammer home of 
when Tyler's talking about all these crazy tools they have to wire together and thread and tell reports and things like it doesn't always have to be this hard. And not only doesn't it, it doesn't have to be this hard, but you can still get MITRE attack alignment. You can still write custom scripts and modules and all these things. And ultimately, something is like creating custom malware it can be incredibly daunting if you have to do it from scratch. But there are better ways to do it. And these things should be trivial. And hopefully, uh, and we'll give a quick demo of that right now. We'll, and we'll demonstrate like how trivial this sort of thing could be. So, you know, taking away all the marketing stuff and terms and adversary emulation and things like that, like, what, Scythe literally on its most base degree is a web interface that makes custom malware specifically this web interface that makes custom malware. Um, I, and uh, Dan and Tyler, can, can you see this? Because if you could see this, I mean, yep. okay, okay. Cool. just to make sure everybody can see it. So yep. this is just a dashboard for, for the Scythe platform. And the goal again is let's make some custom malware together very, very quickly. And, and not only let's create it, but let's also make it repeatable. And let's make it so that, say, a blue teamer can log in and they don't have to learn some crazy Kali Linux, take a two-day course thing. They just want to make some malware that does a thing. Well, one of the ways we action that as Scythe is once we've defined some automation, we can go ahead and save it as a threat in our threat catalog. So here's a bunch of known threat actors or things that we've custom made or a bunch of MITRE attack examples. You know, for example, if you want to test a bunch of things in the MITRE attack discovery column, well, there's a threat right here in Scythe that'll build out some malware for you that fires a bunch of example commands just copied and pasted right out of the MITRE attack matrix. So you can get up and running and build a piece of malware that does these things automatically for you inside of seconds. And now no real threat actor would probably fire these kinds of commands one right after the other because it's kind of ridiculous. But the point is, is that it shouldn't be hard to create a payload that does this for you. And so to, to demonstrate that, let's just make some custom malware here together. So we'll give this malware a name and then we select a target operating system. So what kinds of payloads do we want to generate? EXEs, DLL, shellcode, Mako, uh, ELF binaries, whatever, depending on your target operating system. And so, again, the Scythe platform, uh, go ahead. By, yeah. the, by the way, I, I may interject here just for a second because I'm not sure that everybody fully understands the level of uh, difficulty that this is in order to have a multi-platform piece of C2 and malware. And, and you maybe end up using you know, multiple uh, open source projects. You may use multiple custom projects, like just that functionality alone from a red team standpoint. It's taken, uh, taken 10 years or better to develop and, and a lot of the functionality and even the, the very mature products are just coming up to speed for multi-platform. So just maybe want to highlight that just as a, a really awesome piece. <laughs> no, thanks, and I appreciate that content. Dan, did you have something? You came off. You well, no, I was, I, I, he, he, he rightfully stole, stole the thunder. I was like, just so you know, this is not easy. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, this, you make it sound trivial, but this is the, this is, you know, it, this is amazing, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I did underline the word trivial in the slide. Right, so, right. But, but, but and, and that's the thing, right? The, this, these, the, 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 the standard for today of how to build binaries that do the same behavior on different operating systems, like that is not easy to do from scratch. And right. things that are open source, have many of them have been signatured into oblivion. And, and the point of this is that you don't have to go it alone and you don't have to custom make all these things. Like there's folks out there who do it for you. And Scythe, in this case, is one of them. And, and again, we can, with the single click, you can define what kind of payloads you want to build out. And you can restrict those payloads to specific endpoints or date ranges so that they can't fire outside of those ranges. And then Scythe has this concept of modules. And modules are these the bones of the platform. So for example, if you want to have a piece of malware that phones home over DNS, well, in Scythe, it could be as easy, easy as one click operation right there. And now you've defined that C2 in your malware. Or maybe you want to phone home over HTTPS, but you want to make sure your network monitors are looking for weird traffic. So you set your heartbeats to 10 seconds, and that might be too easy for the network monitors. So maybe you add 50% jitter randomization, right? And the point is, is uh, Tyler's shaking his head. <clears throat> so Tyler, just based on, you know, how long would this take you to do yourself, right? Like just defining these C2 parameters as an example. I mean, done, done right. And like the level of cost on infrastructure to stand this up properly, the time we've built, uh, automating this with, uh, you know, Ansible playbooks and scripts and AWS uh, 
<clears throat> cookbooks and then the custom profiles, the time to build all of these, you know, headers in there or IOCs uh, that can be detected and found. Uh, and then building the comm channel, whether that's, you know, custom Slack C2, DNS, I got to stand up my name server, I got to make sure my names are all categorized, I got to make sure that, you know, the DNS records are all there and set up. I mean, if I'm doing this very, very well, and I've got almost all of this automated very substantially, you know, this is at least a day of work, if not three days of work. Like uh, some of the infrastructure can get very, very intricate. Uh, some of the big red teams I've spent as much as a full week building custom profiles and building infrastructure and putting you know, cloud fronting in place and redirectors and having payload servers stood up uh, to ensure that my jitter rates and, and where the, the payloads are coming from all match specific traffic patterns. So uh, this is very non-trivial. <laughs> Uh, and 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 that's the thing, right? Like, sure, there are, you could absolutely do this yourself, but why? Uh, and, and so, and as we, you know, kind of move on down. So, something as simple as adding artifacts or signature avoidance. Well, Scythe does that for you. So, we every payload Scythe generates for you. Every exe DLL is globally unique every uh, every single time. Um, we do something called import hash randomization under the hood. And since we rolled that out, things like virus total don't notice us as much anymore, which is kind of cool. And then we allow people to set or randomize uh, artifacts like the PDB path and compilation timestamp. And although it's, you know, I can randomize this with one click, the way most folks use this is they set this to, say, Imhotet. Imhotet as a threat always has the same PDB path. So why not set it to that and see if anybody notices? Um, one of my favorite ways to use it is it's doing something like this setting it to something that like is machine readable and hopefully someone in like IR sees that that's neat or maybe you set your timestamp to 2025 that's the goal so it, it should just be trivial to set these sorts of artifacts and values and if the modules uh, you know these are the c2 modules are the bones of the platform we also have capability modules and this window here not only provides the capability modules, but also the meat of the Scythe platform. So again, we're building out our automation like we saw in that template earlier. So for example, if I wanted to build a piece of malware that, uh, I don't know, it uh, dumps the art table and then kicks off a key logger and then takes a screenshot and runs the command, right? Well, I'm just clicking those things from my capability module list here. And as I've done so, it's started to fill up my automation list. And the way this reads is it says, okay, whatever payload we generate, the first thing it should do once it's fired on an endpoint in the user space is reach across the C2 channel and grab the ARP module from the site server uh, and inject that into memory for use later. And then do that with keylogger and print screen and run. And now those things are, are sitting in memory for us to utilize and we can execute our recommended action. So if I click say ARP and print screen, now, step five, we fire that ARP module, which we loaded into memory, to dump and exfiltrate the ARP table. Now, getting an ARP table off an endpoint is not hard. Like, you know, it's, it's a single command. Why? But the point is, is like, instead of having to get a shell and then type this command and copy and paste the results every single time, we just do it all automatically for you. It's just done, right? Or taking a screenshot and exfiltrating it. You all could probably find stuff on GitHub that does this, but it's a one-click op. Or maybe you want to kick off a keylogger. It's a one-click operation. And this is how easy we want to make it to find. And you'll note that it's all being automatically tagged with their MITRE ATT&CK IDs. So we have just that for free, right? Or maybe you want to do something a little more interesting. Maybe you have a custom command you want to utilize. So we will use, say, our run module. And we can go ahead and just throw that in here. And now, if I click Add, I'm running a custom command, right? It's, it's that simple. And the goal is, is that we can build out these templates and scripts and make them repeatable and add delays and logic, and we can fire these things over and over again. So one example is uh, ransomware. So everybody probably has a thing that should be looking for ransomware inside of their organization. Well, here is an example threat that we've made and demoed before, but it's proven so valuable that we've actually had customers request this from us and utilized it in production environments to see if their EDR that they spend a lot of money on finds ransomware. So here, what this does is once the payload fires and loads the things into memory, it creates a directory on the user's desktop. It drops some uh, five, 10 meg files in it that are just nothing in this case. It then uses our crypt module to do ransomware. It encrypts those files, deletes the originals, and then it downloads a ransom note off of Pastebin that we created, and then it terminates its, its process. And it, it's done. So this is 100% real and 100% benign ransomware. And this thing should light up an EDR like a Christmas tree, right, theoretically. 
So yeah, Tyler, you came off mute. Also not trivial. In, in fact, uh, many years ago, before ransomware was really getting big, we, we were asked to do the same thing and, and create this. And um, my good friend, Adam Crompton, encoder, um, he wrote some really, really good ransomware for a client to do this. And again, this, he's probably one of the, the best coders I know, probably one of the best malware authors I know. This was non-trivial to do this well, to emulate the actual ransomware and to provide value that an EDR is going to fire on that was not dangerous to a client or a prod network. So again, in 30 seconds, it's, uh, you know, that was probably a week of, of some headaches that we had. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's a, it's a good problem to have when someone says, oh, I spent a week doing this and the head hits the desk, right? But that's the point. It's it just to, to enable it. And not only to enable it, so you set this up and you can fire it, but you can do it repeatedly. And you don't necessarily need to be an advanced red teamer to fire this threat. You log into site, you click a button, you get a payload. And maybe, maybe somebody catches this. Maybe the blue team starts to signature on it. And you say, well, that's neat. But how about we rule out some variables? Maybe they're just looking at the order of operations. So we have these stackable delays over here. So I'll add a 10 second delay. And now I'll just move, you know, wait 10 seconds between those two, wait 10 minutes between those two, wait 30 minutes between these two. And it's just a click and drag malware creation interface. We've got like WordPress for malware creation, right? And it's that easy to use a template, repeat it, modify it over and over and over again. And what you're, when you're done defining this automation, what you get out of the other side of this are those you know, payloads, are the things that have some signature avoidance, these are the globally unique binaries. These things for all intents and purposes are malware. They're not agents. They run in the user space. You can download, double click them and they will go. Uh, and once they are fired, you get a real time readout of all of the operations you've conducted on that endpoint. So here's one I ran earlier. I had it load modules. I then had it fire the art module. There's the art table off that endpoint. I had it take a screenshot. There's the screenshot off that endpoint. Uh, I had it run a custom command and it loaded some more stuff. It used the sysinfo module, got me the sysinfo, uh, IP config. It's all here. It's all stored and categorized. I can do it automatically. I can do it manually. It all has MITRE attack tags. I can add additional MITRE attack tags if I'm so inclined. All these things are in the database. They can be sent to syslog or Splunk. You can out, uh, export it as a CSV or HTML report. We have executive reports, you know, how far down the kill chain, how many megs of C2 traffic, how many impact ratings and charts and graphs and a MITRE attack summary. What things did we test for? Did they succeed or fail from the adversary perspective? And we, not, uh, we don't need to dive too far down this kind of rabbit hole, but the point is, is that to address some of the issues that Tyler brought up earlier about like getting all this tooling together and categorizing and making sure you recorded every little thing, like there are UIs and interfaces and tools that can help you achieve these goals. And now, off the back of this, if I you know, have some campaigns I've run and I use one of these buttons to export the raw reports from this thing, I can now dump that. And whether or not I want to use the Scythe uh, reporting, that's cool. I can also take this file and hand it off to tools that all they do is help manage reporting, right? Because this is just one data set. As, a red, as part of a, a red team engagement or a pen testing engagement, you might be using Scythe and a bunch of custom tooling and some scanners and the whole nine yards. So, now that we've generated some data quickly and easily and in a repeatable fashion, what do we do with that? And that's where I want to kind of uh, hand it off to Dan and say, well, um, what's next, right? Now that we've done some things. But I'll, yeah, you guys both came off mute. Go ahead. And by, by the way, the correlation of all of those commands and tagging them to a MITRE or whatever framework you're following, the ability to do that alone, like, a, have those notes in one place, have all your operators keeping track of all the commands they're running, uh, what host they were on, what IP address they got back, uh, and, and feeding all that into you know, a platform that's tracking that and you're using that for an operation, but then correlating that to the MITRE stuff, again, having that correlation and having to do that correlation manually is non-trivial. <laughs> Yeah, and just being able to set up that infrastructure per engagement, you know, can be mind-numbing, right? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so so basically, this is, I mean, fantastic, right? And Scythe, I mean, you know, it removes friction, right, in the process, right? And and if we're gonna if we're gonna move the needle, if we, if we if we're gonna do what we would call shift left in cybersecurity, is getting 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 the the friction released in all the process and all of the build out and and actually focusing on 
the actual work that needs to get done, finding the security holes, testing the security posture, and then reporting on that information so you can track the progress. If we can remove as much friction in this entire process, then we're all winning, right? And, and we're not feeling as far behind, right? So, um, so from the PlexTrack perspective, you know, we wanna make sure that we, we can take this data and correlate it with the other information in our environment or the other information that we're gathering during the engagement. So maybe we're not just doing an adversarial, adversarial exercise, we're also doing uh, additional scans and additional penetration testing from the manual perspective or web app penetration testing. Uh, so being able to encompass all of those activities into a single engagement and in a single report we want to be able to make this as trivial as possible to gather and collect that data and then correlate it uh, into a, a, a clean report that the, that the customer or the end stakeholder can then take and begin immediately either collaborating with, with the, the operators as well as the internal team members uh, as well. And then also being able to prioritize that information. So like, hey, based on the fact that we've got this scythe data, right, and they were able to execute this command. Uh, and we already know that this asset is vulnerable to another uh, you know, missing patch, right? Now we need to, you know, we really need to escalate the priority on one, fixing the patch and then finding out the mitigation strategy for a lot, not allowing Scythe to execute this command, right? <laughs> Who is you know, emulating an adversary, right? And I think that's also an important thing to highlight that maybe we kind of overlooked here is that at the end of the day, our mission in cybersecurity is really to uh, detect compromises early in the, in the life cycle as, as, as possible, right? And to be able to try and prevent it and avoid it uh, so that as they get deeper into that attack life cycle, we have a, a, an increasing confidence that, yeah, they may have gotten in and they may get this far, but by, that, by the time they get to the, the later stages in the attack life cycle, we'll have identified their activity and be able to stop it. And I think that's the important thing to note, just as you're building, if you're building out a blue team, you know, I, I, I did build out a blue team and, and our priority was not, hey, we need to avoid compromise at all costs. It's, we know we're gonna get compromised. How quickly can we detect it? And how, how rapidly can we iterate on those detections to try and prevent it you know, the next time? Um, so, so that's where PlexTrack comes in, right? And I think I'm going to have to take over your screen, Adam, or uh, you're going to have to stop. Okay, sharing. I will. I will yield the slides. Perfect. Um, and then let me know that you can see yep. this. Looks good. Okay, cool. And I will move some of these controls around. So, so I've just we've we've set up kind of a uh, you know the uh, the Martha Stewart the cake is already baked kind of a scenario here, right? But. Um, if we were if we were in an engagement uh, or you know in an enterprise and uh, we had different departments right that we could already con that we would already have conducted uh, exercises against so say in the HR department all that we've done is just done some quarterly vulnerability scans you know say from like Nexpos right so we can see the reports uh, and the statistics on these reports for that specific client um, and if we go over to the engineering department. This is where that adversary campaign was run. So let's say that the first run of that campaign that Adam just provided uh, ran in May of 2020. When you, I've already loaded this into the Scythe and I'm gonna show you how to do this, but this is kind of what you get with PlexTrack today um, and the Scythe integration. It comes in and, and Scythe doesn't provide the context of whether this is bad or not, right? And, and rightfully so. Uh, we, we want to, as, as security practitioners, we want to provide as much context as we can, but not assume context. Right? I don't know that um, running this command was bad or not on this asset. Um, that's really up to the engineers and the analysts that are gonna be doing that uh, deeper analysis work. Uh, and so when you, when you bring it out of the box with the Scythe Plex Track integration, you get this data and it kind of comes in as a medium and it does require additional analysis, right? So, but we can see that we have all the same information that we got um, with, uh, within the within the uh, Scythe data and, uh, and can see that this information uh, has you know, all, the, all the same output that we got from, from Scythe and all that. And that's great. And, and this is not where it needs to end because you can, you can get this with Scythe. We get all the tags, we get all that, all that extra data. But, but now I wanna actually start doing some additional work on it, right? Maybe I want to increase the, uh, you know, the severity of this, of this finding, right? To say like, hey, you know what? We really shouldn't be allowing downloaders you know, from external sources that just reach out and go grab files, right? So we're gonna escalate this to, well, let's just say it's a high, just to kind of, for an example, right? So we, we, we increased that, that data to high and now it shows up there. 
Um, we can also start uh, collaborating on this, right? So like, let's say, okay, I need to actually assign this to somebody and move this to an in-process state. And so this is, this is part of that prioritization and that ongoing collaboration that we want to make sure throughout the engagement. So this could even happen in real time during an engagement and say, I want to assign it to, to Tyler. And I say like, I'm not sure how you did this, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, so then Tyler could even come back in and respond to this and say like, okay, well, here's how, here's how it was conducted, here's what we did, and here's, here's additional information on maybe how to fix it. Uh, and then we can continue to see these, these statistics start to gather in real time. Uh, but um, but that's that's all well and good. But for for like let's say over time I have an idea of like hey I know that uh, these loader commands within Scythe I don't necessarily want to um, always have to go and change these to an informational right like uh, I, 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 I this is to me just kind of an informational activity I don't want to consider this a finding so I'm just going to change that to um, an informational right where it kind of pops down here and, and shows. Um, I'd, I'd like to be able to just have this happen automatically when I bring that Scythe data in. Uh, so let's, let's now jump over to like, okay, so like we did the adversary campaign um, within May 2020. Now we're actually doing like a full purple team engagement where it's going to include some vulnerability scanning information. It's going to maybe include some web app. Uh, we're going to we're going to collaborate closely with the blue team, um, and I'm going to bring in this Scythe information. Right? <clears throat> um, we have this we have this handy feature within PlexTrack called parser integrations. So if I were to select the the Scythe parser, I can now see all the different commands that have have been populated as we've brought results in, and I can specify like you know what I want to consider this an informational, uh, where it's just it's just added added information for for our analysis. Um, but, you know, something like the downloader, I want to actually default that to a high finding. And something like this crypt command, that's really serious. Like, that's actually emulating uh, ransomware on our machine. So I want to consider that a critical finding. So if we were to go back over to this full purple team engagement, now I've, I've got, I've pre-populated this with a, a vulnerability scan from Nexpos, right? So I brought this data in, we've got some assets that we've, we've already scanned as part of this engagement. And I've already, you know, tagged some of these findings. Hey, this is, this is from Nexpos. We've got the different attack tactics that it applies to. Um, but now I want to bring in that additional Scythe information, right? So I, I come over to the Scythe data um, and it was re-ran, right? So we've got this second run of the campaign. So maybe they fixed some things in between the May the May campaign and, and the June purple team exercise. So you notice that all, that all came in, but you also notice that it brought this crypt one in as, as a critical already, but it was closed out. So that means that something happened, we got this asset that was closed and we can see the different runs, right? So it, it, it was successful and then it failed. And so in the Scythe, you know, in, in the attack simulation perspective, when, it, when a campaign uh, activity fails, that means a good, that's good for the, uh, for the blue team. So it automatically closed that out, but you'll notice that it, it did categorize that automatically as a critical finding, whereas all of these loader, uh, these loader commands, you know, loading the art modules, those, that's just informational informa uh, you know, data that we can now start to analyze even further. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of like how we can, how we can enhance the, the reporting and collection and prioritization process within our, within our uh, site integration. Uh, and then in, we can continue to collaborate and we can continue to show progress on, on how we're fixing these items. Uh, if we were to uh, want to say like, okay, say we've completed the, the, the assessment, but I want to provide maybe like one more finding that's like a web app related one, just for an example, we can, we can go and grab a SQL injection finding, right, from our write-ups database, bring that in. And, and, and not only can we uh, enhance that report, you know, make this super easy to bring other findings into a report and into an engagement, but we can also enrich this data. So I can actually add videos um, to our, to our, to our results. So this, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Tyler, I don't know about you, but I know in my pen testing days, um, a screenshot, a series of screenshots can only tell the story so far, right? So being able to have a video tied to, uh, tied to, the finding, you know, just makes it uh, that much better in order to be able to reproduce that moving forward. Uh, so you um, see, just just having the ability to have a central location for recommendations and findings, and then the ability to add the custom finding to a report with you know the screenshot in a collaborative sense, like. If you can do that with Word, let me know because you know, we've, <laughs> we've been fighting that battle uh, and 
I'm sure all of y'all love uh, latex uh, on top of that. So you know, maybe you, maybe you do it that way, and that's that's uh, that's working out well for you. But yeah. this is this is definitely a much easier, much more sophisticated way of doing this. Yeah, and and when we talk about the collaboration piece, you know, I can come in and I can I can not only start assigning these uh, to users, um, or I'm going to say like, hey, uh, you know, Adam, you're you're on top of this one. Uh, you know, and Adam will get notified, you know, if I use his actual email address, you know, that Adam would get this and then he would get a little notification icon that, hey, I've been assigned to some issues and I need to go start working on those. And this is important from that, from that collaborative piece. And that's kind of why, you know, I, I asked those questions early on uh, about, you know, if, if, if we'd only been able to collaborate early in the process of, these, of, the, of fixing these items, they may not pop up again. But I also have a historical track record over time for, for analysis. And we'll come to the analytics here in a second. But um, we also have the ability to keep up uh, the artifacts, right? You can upload different artifacts that you've included in the report um, or, you know, that were used to, to cult cultivate that report. So you have the ability to track and, and aggregate all this data that goes into a, a comprehensive engagement. And I, I just mentioned that, that that's important from, from the fact that we want to make sure that we are, are being able to show off the best work that, and, and all the effort that did go into it and, and be able to provide as much in context around how, how you came to that, uh, these conclusions. One last thing I'll highlight is that we do have this report narrative section where you know, a lot of tools and platforms today, you, know, you get the data and you get the collection, but you don't have a lot of uh, room to be able to extrapolate on like what you did and why this is important and be able to, to, to map out that attack path. Um, so I have full disclosure, I just went and grabbed offensive security sample penetration test report, you know, um, so this kind of is a highlight of like, this is what sucks to have to build manually and what we could do, you know, and, and so like, you know, even within the report summary, you know, I can, I can grab a screenshot here and, and I can just go ahead and just paste this straight in, you know, as I'm building out, as I'm building out the, the report. And you know you could you could also bring in the other scythe, uh, you know, screenshots and things like that for attack path as well. And so we just start to see that, that we're able to progress over time. Um, before I jump into analytics, I know we're kind of running short on time, but uh, you know, we, can, we can export this into, into custom templates as well. So from the red team perspective, uh, you're gonna have your, your, custom, uh, your custom docx is, oops, docx is not commonly downloaded and may be dangerous. I will keep this file. Um, so, uh, as, as, as you, as you're building out your report, uh, you may want to hand off an artifact, uh, which is that deliverable or like the, the, the document export, you may want to hand this off to different stakeholders. The nice thing with Plextrack is we, we, we fully support custom templating. So you can have the same data be represented in multiple ways in different types of documents. Um, so in this one, ah, I keep locking my screen out, but. Uh, we can we can pull this up and, and here's this full purple team report in our custom template, um, but you can see that we automatically bring all this data in with a quick uh, you know uh, quick click you know you can bring in these findings we see this we see all the findings there here's that summary of results with that with that screenshot it's already fully you know uh, formatted and everything so you you eliminate the the need to have to heavily document or heavily format Word documents, which is a huge friction point in this whole process, right? And you can also customize how you want to visualize the data within these templates, right? And within these reports. Um, and it's, it's crazy, again, just to jump in really quick, like this is the head smacker from a reporting standpoint, because <laughs> the amount of hours that have been spent making these things look good in LaTeX and GitHub repos and like, th as far as or, this as a thing <laughs> is just, astounding like mind-bogglingly painful yeah, it, yeah it's just to do this the state of the art in this uh before something like plex track is just was bonkers and this well, is lovely and i don't know i mean like i i'm gonna date myself but i was pen testing before high def uh screens <laughs> right so like nowadays you go do a screenshot on like a high res 4k monitor and you try to like paste that into a word document and the, you know, the, the image is like that, right? <laughs> you know, it just goes, you know, huge, right? So just even like the amount of time it takes to, to format the, just the screenshots, uh, you know, is, is, is ginormous, right? So, um, so real quick, I'll, I'll dive into what else we can do with this data now that we've 
aggregated it with vulnerability scans, with pen testing, um, with the scythe information is really is really to be able to start doing analytics, right? If I want to say like, okay, how are we how are we stacking up against some of these tactics and techniques, right? You know, um, you know, we've got we've got two finding two critical findings across two different engagements. Um, that are showing up with this SNMP community issue. Um, maybe we want to also look at the uh, the crypt the crypto uh, uh, ransomware, right? So you know now we can start to start get analytics, and we and and as we start doing this, we start to get trends over time. You can see what our most critical our issues are and how they're distributed across the different departments and across those different reports, right? So here we we had it as one, here we have it as uh, you know critical. So it's important that we can be able to filter this data down and be able to start painting a picture for the right stakeholders at the right time to show, you know, where are the findings. Um, this is new functionality to PlexTrack, um, but like you know, we can see like what assets are are uh, you know having the most issues right uh, within our environment. Uh, I'll kind of go back over to the engineering because I kind of skipped over that, but like in the campaign itself. Uh, we can look at the different asset information. And if we dive into this asset, we can see, hey, this asset has this many findings associated with it and its instance count. I've, re I've imported this scan into two different reports. So it shows up twice, but it's the same issue, right? And so when we close it out one in one place, it's closed out in both places. Um, so, so this just kind of highlights the power of being able to take something and remove the friction of getting the data, you know, through, through an integration like Scythe bringing that together with the other activities that are going on in the organization and being able to track this over time and being able to collaborate quickly across the different uh, uh, stakeholders as well uh, eliminates more friction uh, throughout that entire life cycle of this vulnerability right uh, of these findings and really enhances the ability to paint that story uh, to the right people with that we've got Four minutes for questions. <laughs> I mean, the, so the, the, uh, we're really we're kind of run out of time. If anybody has questions, go ahead and throw them in. We'll hopefully uh, be able to get at least one or two of them. But Tyler, if you could just kind of bring us home, uh, you know, paint you painted a pretty bleak and time-consuming picture of being a modern red teamer. Uh, like, do, do you feel like, given the things that we've shown here today, that you know, we are moving forward and starting, starting to solve some of those problems and to what degree and just, can you speak a little bit to that in the last 60 seconds or two, two minutes that we have? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. From, from a red team standpoint, like what you've seen is really a lot of the pain points that uh, any of this time that, that we save, uh, whether it's reporting, whether it's tracking more accurately, whether it's uh, not having to stand up infrastructure, not having to build custom payloads or specific tools, all of the savings is, adding value to the clients and that that client may be you you may be on the offensive team but that value is being added so that we do better testing we get better coverage we track results better i mean analytics alone we can't we don't even have the capability to do from an offensive or defensive side very well uh, in collaboration with with the red team so all of these things, bringing all these together, uh, lets the red teamers do what they do best. And that is really bring the adversarial mindset. It frees up the time for us to provide the value that we really do provide, which is hacking all the things and doing that very, very well for you. So uh, this is definitely uh, super exciting and I see so much value coming out of this uh, long-term. Great. Well, uh, in the last couple uh, minutes we've got, and again, thank you everyone for, for coming today. And we really appreciate the, uh, everybody coming and see, having us talk about stuff and show off some tools and, and uh, the, the attendance and the, us all driving the community together. This is what's important. So the uh, last things, um, Tyler, do you have any sort of announcements or anything that we should know about before we run out of time here? Or? No, come check out... Uh... Come check out Security Weekly on Thursdays. That's where you'll find a lot of this commentary and my bantering uh, similar to this. So. Perfect. And then, Dan, do you have any sort of uh, last pieces of the camera or announcements? Yeah, yeah, real fast. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned Security Weekly because that was not planned. But, yeah, I'm actually going to be – we're going to be on uh, Security Weekly on the 11th. So check out that episode for sure um, and all the episodes. But, um you know, you, we, we teased it today, but we've got some enhanced analytics capabilities being out in our next release of PlexTrack. 
Um, and then we did just open up a new basic plan offering within PlexTrack where you can uh, buy online, get your, get your feet wet with PlexTrack, uh, and really start you know, being able to remove some of the friction in your own reporting process. So definitely check us out at PlexTrack.com. Great, thanks. And then the last thing for me is uh, Scythe. We're also doing a big release upcoming. We're releasing a marketplace and new SDKs and a bunch of really cool stuff. Uh, so yeah, just find us on Twitter, Scythe.io. And thank you again for, to uh, Tyler and Dan for uh, coming online and to talking to us about uh, the various challenges and solutions we've got. And uh, we really appreciate the time. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and, and thank you all for uh, spending an afternoon with us.